interview has been conducted for St John Scotland, 75 years of making a difference. My name is Dr Sue Morrison and the respondent is Anne Calderwood. This is the 2nd of December 2021 and the interview is taking place in Stranraer. Thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed for the project Anne. You're very welcome. For the record, would you please confirm your full name? My full name is Annie Hannah Calderwood. And uh, would you mind telling me your age or just your 87. Year? Sorry? 87. Really? Yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you look good on it. Um, where were you brought up? I was brought up in Glasgow. Uh, and I went to Hillhead High School there and became captain of the school there. And when I left, it was just still in the period after the war and there was still a lot of uh, the armed forces coming back home seeking work and jobs were very difficult to come by. I, I did not want to go to university anyway. I had never had any ideas about that. And then I got a post as a junior uh, in quality section of the administrative headquarters of Elders, Elf, not Eldersley, of Fergusley and uh, the Paisley Mills. That's where I was and behind a desk and that didn't really suit me at all. And as soon as I became 20, which was the minimum age you could apply, I applied for the police force in Glasgow and I was accepted and I stayed there for 12 years and then I was seconded for two years to Hong Kong police force and that was quite successful and I stayed with them then I went on to the establishment there uh, for the rest of my career and that's where I was very accomplished. No, I don't know if that was right or wrong. <laughs> it's not for me to say. <laughs> so, when did you come to Stranra? Well, my mother is, is a native, more or less, of Stranra, and uh, my father was an electrical and mechanical engineer with the London Midland Scottish Railways. Uh, so, he, he had his work there and my mother, when they married, went to Glasgow, you see. And we stayed in Knightswood at that time in one of the corporation flats. Uh, it, but it was a lovely area at that time, it just had been built. And we grew, I grew up there and, as I say, went to school in Glasgow. And then we moved out to what, what was then the village of Drumchapel. You've maybe heard of Drumchapel, which is a huge area now. But it was a village in those days, in the peripheral, you know. And uh, then, when they when my father retired, they came down to Stranraer because my brother was here with his family, and my father wanted to come back down here. And uh, so they retired here, and of course I was in Hong Kong at the time. And then when I retired, I came home to be with them. You see. So that was it. <laughs> that was the story in a nutshell. <laughs> what was it like to be back in Scotland? It was so different. You know, green fields. Of course, there was greenery in Hong Kong too, of course. But green fields and space and the pace of life was so much uh, quieter and, you know, leisurely almost, you know. Uh, but I saw a great difference in Scotland when I came back. That was in '78. 78, uh, 79 actually, I retired, but I was on leave at, before that. Um, I found people different. Yes, it wasn't the same place. It was a, a kind of new era I was beginning, you know, and it just, it just wasn't the same. And I, I remember remarking about that when I came home at first, you know. You know. It's, uh, I think maybe it would be the start of the modern era, I don't know, but uh, I thought there was big changes in the offing, which has proved unfortunately correct. <laughs> mm. 
When did you first hear about St John Scotland? Well, um, John Calvert, here we go, Dr Calvert uh, knew, knew me because he was our uh, general practitioner and he attended to my parents very, very well indeed. And in fact, I had to write to him. In fact, I, when I came home on one of my leaves, I went to see him because I knew my mother had had a heart attack. My father wasn't just as what he used to be. And I asked him just what, what he felt the position was. I said, because I've got to consider them rather than myself, you see. I, I'm away, my brother and his wife and family. They were very good to them, yes, but they in turn kept an eye on them, you see. And he, he, he told me just what the position was. And I said, right, I'm intending to put in my uh, resignation or retirement notice. I said, there's only one way I can, or two ways I can come out, either on medical grounds or on compassionate grounds. I said, the medical grounds, no way. Compassionate, I don't know, but I'll try. So he said, right. I said, now, if, if I'm having difficulty, could I write to you for a confirmation of what you said? He said, yes. And that's what I did. And that was the letter that got me out, really, in a way. I was sorry to leave, because I could have done another ten years, but I thought I was doing the right thing. And I still do think I did the right thing. It wasn't, I didn't go out there for money. I went out for experience and to teach. You know, and that was it. So that was it. So what did you do um, initially with St John Scotland? Well, St. A, Dr John, when, he, when I came home on retirement, came, uh, or he phoned, I, I can't remember if he came personally or, or phoned, and he wanted me to come and join St John. And I said, look, my mother and father were deteriorating, and I had lost my mother by then, and my father wasn't good. I said, look, I can't, I can't come just now. I worked part-time because I didn't have a pension, you see, I came out early at that particular time and I, and I had to wait ten years before my pension would accrue. And I was working part-time in, in Stranraer and uh, so I said, I can't do it, John. So he accepted that and then when my father died, he again came to me and asked me. And so it was in 1986 I joined the committee of St John. That's how it happened. What were your duties? In St John? Well, we, we were just a committee and we raised funds. And at that time our fundraising was really for volunteer transport to take people who lived at home but required a little bit of respite for, for their family and that had been ongoing for some time and that was the main object at the time that St John did. Uh, I mean we did fundraising for that because it was all volunteers and I think if I remember correctly Originally, they they managed to get an old ambulance. I think that's that's what ha happened. This is again. I wasn't there at the time, but I think I remember hearing about that. And uh, there was the dentist, uh, Mr. Kerr, and there were a, a, a lawyer, Mr. William Ray. See, all these people are dead now. Mr. William Ray, he, I think he was the treasurer at the time, and the procurator fiscal of this area was the a chairman. That was how it all had started, I believe, and they had started this volunteer. And Dr. Calvert, who came to the area after it was set up, see, 1976, Stranraer opened, the Stranraer a association started, I believe, and when Dr. Calvert came, he was invited to the a committee meeting, I think it would be, to address them on, I suppose, maybe medical things, you know, and this is how this started, and the volunteer transport improved and improved, you know, 
And uh, when I went on the committee in 86, I used to go along to the old Dirimple Hospital, which was for elderly people, but there was a, an area reserved for the respite people. I think it was three times a week they went in. And they could have a bath, have their hair washed, get, have their lunch, and uh, cheese and biscuits and that kind of thing. They played games and that kind of thing. You know, they were for usually elderly people. And I went along to help, and it, it was very, it was really was very encouraging. And we did a lot of that at that particular time initially. And it was then in a, we had little sales tables that we had at that time. And I think I'm right in saying they had started an art exhibition, which took place in Port Patrick Hall. And Jan Holak and another lady who, unfortunately, her name escapes me now, she lived out at Cairn Ryan. And they kind of set up that, that thing and they were both on the committee. And that was the start of our art exhibition. And we were the, I think I'm right in saying we were the first in Scotland to have art exhibitions which brought in a lot of money. And then, it was in the 80s, by, yes, it would be in the 80s. We transferred to Northwest Castle, a hotel there, and Mr. Macmillan was very gracious with us, and he let us have the Duke of Edinburgh's uh, room. It was a lovely room, and he put up uh, strappings along his walls so that we could hang all the paintings, and we had that once a year and that brought in a lot of money, a lot of money, from artists, you know, in local artists usually, as far away maybe as Tim Fries and Gatehouse of Fleet and that kind of thing, sometimes from Glasgow too. And after that, Glasgow and all the others started, and after about 20 years, it kind of petered out because there was too many, you know. That, it, had, it had done its job, but yeah, we had to look for other things. That, that's how it, I think, emerged. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any other fundraising events? Oh well, in the nineties, this is the big. This is when you come to the the big thing. It was in the early nineties. Doctor Calvert said, "Look, we need a new project now. We, we really need to do something here." What could we do? And we we went, we had people from the blind uh, the guide dogs came down, but they said at that time that they had sufficient money to meet their commitments, and they they we weren't really expanding the way they are now, you know. So that that kind of died a certain day, and then again through Doctor Calvert's contacts, he knew, he, he worked, I think, fairly closely with a Dr. Martin, who was a consultant oncologist at Dumfries Royal Infirmary, and she was a lovely, lovely lady. I didn't know her at that time. And he heard about her, and she put him in touch with one of our nurses here, who was on a course, a diploma course, for the Macmillan people. And part of her course was to write a lecture, or, or a, th a thesis really, a thesis it was, in palliative care in the community. And she had done that. And she had presented it to the health board in De Vries. And they said, very worthy cause, very vet and very well done, you know, etc. But they had no money. So that's how we got to hear about it. And Irene, Dr. A sister, she was a sister, Sister Irene Hunter, came with Dr. Martin one evening to our committee meeting. And she laid forth this thesis 
and we quickly looked at it. She had copies with her. I, I haven't got a copy of it, and I don't know if anybody will have now. But uh, we looked through it, and then they went away. And we discussed it. And Dr. Calvert was very enthusiastic. And so was I. I was one of the newer members, remember, at this time. And I said, definitely, I would back him the whole way. He said, well, if we accept this, we'll have to work. Because we've, we've really not got the money for this kind of thing. And we thought, now, what can we do? So, we thought about it. And of course, in liaison now, when we'd accepted it, we liaised with the health board. We had to do that, you know. Uh, and so it came about that Dr. Martin came in on it, and in the end, she agreed if we could set up the necessary arrangements, uh, she could come through periodically and she could maybe have a little clinic here. Well, they gave her, I think, a broom cupboard. That was all they had in those, and at that time, it, that was in the old Garrick Hospital that we had. Anyway, it was accepted and it was brushed up and kind of thing. And I think there was hardly room for her and any patient, you know, that came in. And this was for cancer, of course, cancer patients. There was nothing you see here. And that proved, yes, successful, you would say over months, you know, but it was costing us, it was to cost us 5,000 a year to to keep her here. You know, when I say keep her, she came up periodically. Well, we had to find that money, you know, so of course, fundraising started. And, uh, well, we, we, the art exhibition, of course, was still once a year. That, that was in, in being, we, we had curry suppers. Uh, occasionally, you see, uh, I know I did one or two, and I think it was for eight people at a time. Monthly I did them, but you had to be careful just who you invited so that they were compatible. Well, you know, with each other, you've got to consider all these points. So we did these. I made, uh, well, I, not me, but we made bird boxes and bird feeders and sold them at the art exhibition. They, they, I think they came in about 150 and two pounds in those days, but it was still money coming in, you know. We had the art exhibition, as I say, um, with the featuring at Northwest Castle, and that continued for about 20 years there. It, it was wonderful, and he didn't charge us anything. No, he's a, he's a great philanthropist, the old boy. A Jan, Jan, Jan Holak, she made Christmas cards because she's an artist, uh, very badly uh, affected in, in the arms and toes with a rheumatoid arthritis. She had to give up her, her teaching, but she made Christmas cards out of her, her uh, artistic ways. We, we sold a lot of these. I think one year we had a calendar too, we did that. We had a most wonderful fair in Ardwell Estate. That was where a, our Lord Lieutenant lived. And she graciously said we could have it on the front lawn. And we had that one, one afternoon in June, I think it was, one year, and I can't remember the year. But it must have been between, must have been between, 93 and 95, 90, 96 it opened. Yes, it, it was in the early 90s anyway. And that was a great success. I mean, we, we, they came from all over. That was really, and it was a good day and we'd teas and lunches and all that. We organized a jazz concert and we got down, we got a semi-professional a number from Glasgow. I knew one particular person who had grown up with me in Glasgow and uh, he'd become very well known and he organised this jazz. I can't even remember 
the, the name of the people, but it was a very big success and we had that in the Ryan Centre in Stranraer. Uh, of course we had the shop cans, you know, it, we had one member went round and collected them about every three months and it brought in five or six hundred pounds, you know, every so often. Then the Rotary Club became interested in this project we had of palliative care and uh, they said they would get help out in the end and I think they, in the end they gave us £20,000. Yes, they were very, very generous and there's a plaque in the hospital dedicated to, to the amount that they gave. Mm -hmm. And of course the, there's one of the cancer uh, parts in the hospital uh, dedicated now to St, the order of St. Uh, to John Calvert, the John Calvert unit, yes. And we went out about giving talks uh, to churches, to uh, all kinds of people, you know. And that's how we, we, we made our money. Then Dr. Calvert in our little cupboard, we realised we had to do something better than that. And she then went round some of the patients' homes, their, their dwelling homes, and interviewed them there. And she was such, everybody spoke so highly of her. She, she, I didn't know her well, I only met her on the one occasion, but her name spread throughout, you know, Dumfries and Gow. She's now retired, of course, that lady. That's and Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin, that's right. And uh, that, that was how, how we all began. And, and that necessity of going on the domiciliary visits that she had was highly successful too. But we knew she couldn't continue doing that. You know, she had her own thing. And so we then said, right. And we got in touch with the health board and they, it was agreed that our hope that we could have a, a unit, a medical unit, if possible it was in the hospital. And so they, they agreed. Now this is to the old Dorimple Hospital, which, which was for old people at that time. Well, they transferred a part of that hospital and they, they gave it, they, they built an archway between when I say it, they built an archway between the hospital and, and our unit, it was ju it just flowed through, you know, you just walked through it. But this archway made all the difference. And when you walked through that archway and you came to the two-bedded ensuite unit, there was something about, an aura about that place, and everybody spoke about this, and it was true. Even the nurses said it was a very special place. The carpets were different, the walls were different, and you walked into each bedroom, and we provided flowers and uh, sweetmeats, magazines for them, uh, the drapes and the windows. We were responsible for all that. Some of the early furniture we, we provided too. We, we did that initially to see how it would work out. And then there was a, a little quiet room for the relatives just to sit. And they, the nurses allowed them to use their facilities to make a cup of coffee and we provided biscuits and that kind of thing for them. And that's how it all started. And it was wonderful. Then, of course, the bombshells came when a new hospital was to be built. Of course, it was badly needed. We knew that. And so the community hospital that we now have, the plans were all made, of course, years before. Well, you had to put, we had to say, well, but wait a minute, we'll, we want a unit there. We've got to have this unit. This unit is established now. So that lovely place was demolished. Mind you, the hospital needed demolishing, let's be fair about it, but this unit was something very, very special. And, of course, it was opened in May 1996. And that was when we took the first patients in. And in August 1996, Her Majesty the Queen came and officially opened it. 
and that was great. That was a great moment. But it was in the old place, you see. And she she was very taken with it too, yes. That was the day, the last time she was up here in the Royal Yacht because it was on its way to Leith, you know. So that was it. Well, after some, uh, some negotiation, of course, our unit was immediately then it's, it's, uh, they, they agreed that they would uh, have a unit put in, but it wasn't a unit that was originally in the plans, so they had to op make alterations. Now it's a lovely, it's a nice place, it's not the same as our initial unit, but it does a lot of good work and it has uh, it gets great praise. And the unfortunate thing is about the unit, but we've got to be practical here. We get a lot of money from relatives who have lost, you know, dear ones. That's true. But it still keeps us going. We get a lot of money. And when, you know, they die and there's a church service, a lot of relatives they want a retiring connection. And that's what brings in a lot of money too, you know. But the last two years, of course, there's been no fundraising possible. So it, we've, we've kind of we've not died. Don't get wrong, me wrong. It was, it's in no way dead, but and they, they still I think have committee meetings. See, I'm not on the committee. I came off the committee. I think it was in 2002. Uh, I had served 16 years, and I thought it was only right that I should come off and let somebody else, you know, carry on. We were tired. I'll tell you when when the palliative came, the whole committee were tired because I had said, you know, right from the start, now look, if we begin this thing, we've got to see it through, and I expect everyone to pull their weight. You know, you had to say that. I, well, I, that's the way I work, you know. And so it was a success, but it wasn't a success through me. It was a success by the people that worked there, and particularly Dr. John Carbert and Pat. Definitely. Mm -hmm. They're the mainstay. And I think Kenny Patterson would agree with me. We also, of course, run a transport system. That came in the wake. Again, my brother was very much involved with that for a while. Uh, again, volunteer drivers initially, then uh, the St John in Edinburgh, we, we were after them of course, and we felt it was such an, an important thing because transport from here to Dumfries is such a long way and people don't appreciate it, it's 150 miles round, well it's now 148 to be right, you know, to be tr truthful, uh, but it's a long way for people and when they're not well, I mean, you know, it's difficult. And they were going in private cars, which was quite good, but it wasn't as comfortable as it should have been. So we approached a, a, the... I was off the committee by then, and so I, this is kind of hearsay. Uh, they approached, I, th I think I'm right in saying this, they approached Edinburgh, and Edinburgh very kindly gave us our first people carrier. And that was a five, I think it was a five-seater at that time. And uh, there, were, there were one or two wee niggly things, like sometimes it was too high to, for people to get in. So we had a wee, a wee uh, step made. That was fine. But it wasn't just ideal. Where do you put the thing? Because if people were going down to Dumfries, and maybe sometimes we had to go to Edinburgh with them, because at that time... Dumfries, the Dumfries section was part of the Stranraer one. We we guided them, if you like, initially, but then they're now on their own, eh, and they have their own transport now, which is good. And in fact, we gave them our old transport. The first people carrier went to them, and then we, my my, eh, well, not just my sister-in-law, but but committee members. Eh, had coffee mornings in the summer 
and invited, you know, people to get. I, th I think they sold tickets, in fact, to, to come to it. And it was always home baking, you know, and we had them in the gardens and that kind of thing. And that brought in some money. And eventually we bought a people carrier ourselves. And the volunteer drivers were kind of, maybe they, I think they did the weekend runs and the people carrier was used on the weekdays. I think that's the way it operated. And then the insurance came and the insurance was going to be all oh, terrible for the volunteer drivers because you know they they were tightening up all the things which from health and safety I suppose was understandable and so that petered out that they still stand by for emergencies a real um, emergency but we now operate two people carriers here and uh, oh. They, they, we, we liaise closely with Dumfries, of course, you know, we, we go down to Dumfries, I, th I think I'm right in saying they go down to Dumfries now and the Dumfries ones take them up to Edinburgh and then when they come back down we, we transport them from Dumfries back home, you know. But the people carriers are seventh seater and they're sliding doors, which is excellent and everybody says they're so comfortable. You know, and if anybody does take ill or or did take ill a, a, in the initial stages, you could call in at Castle Douglas, a, a little hospital, or Newton Stewart. But Newton Stewart is no longer operable just now, so I don't know what they would do. You know, but uh, no, it, it's been very successful, um, and it's still going on. It's needed. No. And, and there is also hospice at home. St John has a hospice at home, a few nurses. Uh, when we set up the palliative care, or I'm, go, I'm going back and now, when we set up the palliative care unit, we um, met the costs of these girls going on courses. And we, we put them through, I think in all, we put through four or five of the nurses. It's a, a special course that we go on with. So. Anne, could you describe the present palliative care unit to me? It's a two-bedded uh, en suite uh, unit. And there's, uh, added on to that is the, what we call the quiet room for relatives. That has improved because... There is a fridge there, there's always milk, uh, you know, uh, there, and if people want to put things in, uh, extra things, uh, it works out very well. And the, of course the patients can stay, uh, I think they, they even allow, depending on the circumstances, uh, beds put up in the rooms. You see that they are palatial rooms, and the rooms have little verandas on them that they can open the do French win uh, doors and they could wheel them out or the, if they're able to if they're able to walk sit outside you know on a nice day uh, I don't think that happens very often in <laughs> Stuart with due respect but it's there uh, we have a group of volunteer women uh, that a uh, that, 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 that started in my day too, right enough. Uh, there was about 24 women uh, volunteered for that and they had a month, yes, uh, usually a month about. Uh, it usually worked out about once a year. You were on the rota, sometimes twice. And they would go in every week on that, win on that week, a month they were on duty and they would uh, make sure that the flowers were, were, were you know, up to date. Uh, enough biscuits, tea, coffee. Uh, the milk, we never provided that for obvious reasons, it goes off. But uh, they, they always have it, you know. And uh, it worked out very well, but then rules and regulations stopped us putting flowers in. There's no flowers allowed in hospitals now. And... Uh, 
So that had, but the girl, the lady still, I believe, put in, a, you know, biscuits and tea and coffee, and see the place is kept tidy. That that's the main thing. And magazines for for the quiet room. It, it still operates, but not to the same degree, you know. And of course, the health board really are in charge now. You know, uh, we we are invited, if you like. It's like you know, a guest coming in and and doing their little bit for for the the the, the health board. But that that's it. But the 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 palliative care. I think, and I might be wrong in this, so maybe you better not quote me. I think the palliative care unit it was the first in Scotland down here. I think I'm right. If it wasn't the first it was one of the earliest and as for the transport I think we were the first two with the transport. I might be wrong and we're the smallest area. We're the smallest area. It, it, you know, but size wise, mileage, it's a huge area. Mm. And you see, we, we have people, the people carriers got to go out to the villages and, and collect the folks who to go to Edinburgh and all that. Now they leave about six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it's a long day for them. But they do it, and they do it willingly. The other thing I, I maybe should have said to you, when we agreed, you know, that the hospice eh, was to be built, eh, or to be, yes, to be built, uh, the health board did agree, you see, the, the costing was a big thing, and the costing, we've said, St John, w was £100,000. That's what we had to raise, and we did it. And the health board had to put in 100000 and they agreed for the same amount. And and Rotary came in, as I told you, with tw I'm sure it was 20000 they gave us. But these concerts brought in a lot of money, and uh, just... The, the public were excellent, you know, they're very generous people down here. They maybe don't have much, but if they've got, if they've got anything they've got, they'll give it to you. Yes. You see, this is actually a depressed area. Always has been because it's farming. You know, you don't have philanthropists down here at all. But uh, uh, that, 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 that I should have mentioned the health board because I wouldn't like them to think that I haven't put them in. <laughs> so I think that's that's about the best of it. So is, is the palliative care unit quite well known in the area? Yes, oh yes, and it's used. It's used. I, yes, it's, it's used extensively. And if there's nobody in it, you know, if, if on occasions there might not be, if there's a very seriously ill patient, well, we, we have nothing to do with it now. The, the the hospital will put in a serious ill patient, you know, say it was maybe a stroke or something like that. Well, that's good. It's, it's used. That's what it's for. But we can't exp extend it from, from St John's point of view much further on the palliative case then, because it's so expensive, you know. And we, we still put in uh, things that are, are necessary, little extras you'd say, you know, but the health board have more or less taken over eh, the running of it, you know. You've mentioned Dr Calvert, John Calvert, quite a bit, and his wife Pat. Yes. Um, sadly, John is no longer with us. Right. Um, could you tell me something about the two of them, please? They were a lovely couple, a lovely couple with a lovely family. They had great faith, great faith. They were great members of this church here, very, very devout. And they just were such a pleasant couple to be with, in, in the company of. And if they asked you to do something, there's no way you could say no. That is quite true. You know, and he, he was a very clever fellow. He was clever, but you wouldn't have known that. He was he, he he was he went about his business, and he always had his white coat on. Today you never see a doctor with a white coat on. Uh, 
he was a dapper little man, he really was. And he, in fact, when he retired, he wanted to, to learn to play the piano, and he took lessons for that. Yes, uh -huh. and we we used to, in the early days, we used to meet the Dumfries people because we, we, we got them to, to have a committee and we used to meet them down at Gate House of the Fleet uh, maybe twice a year and we would, we would have the, we'd discuss business with them, what, what, what was on the go and they were, they were great, they were good too and uh, then we would have a lovely meal together, you know, it was a kind of social a gathering too, but that that and he was he was all for that kind of thing, you know, and he loved traditional jazz. He loved tr traditional jazz. That was one of his great joys, to tell you the truth. He was a great gardener, yeah, and uh, he lived out out in the car. Well, you were out at Pat's thing. That was a new house, but the old house, that was where they lived. Ah, oh, that was where they lived before they built the the, the two bungalows. Uh -huh. And Pat was also involved with St John Scotland. Oh yes, right, right. For she she was she was at his his side all the time. Yes, yes. He, as I say, he said he went to give them a a little talk one night, and he, he was <laughs> collared, and and that was the start of it. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. He's greatly missed in, in this area, and I'm sure in this church too. Mm -hmm. He was a reader in the church, yes. He trained to be a, a reader after he retired. Mm -hmm. He was quite a small man in stature, but oh, full of life, full of life. Mm -hmm. Just a joy to be in, in his company. And one of many talents. Yes, definitely. Oh, he's a clever, clever. He, uh, I, I couldn't give you all his uh, letters after his name. It wasn't just MD or anything like that. I think there was three or four. He, he was uh, always highly qualified. We miss him very much. <laughs> Could you tell me about any of the other characters apart from John? Well, there's, Pat? there's Kenny Patterson. I think you've met him. Well, Kenny has been a chairman for a long time. Uh, in fact, I think he's just recently given it up, but he's still on the committee as an advisor. Uh, there's Kenny. Um, oh, well, there was John, uh, there was a uh, Miss, was it John McIntyre? I think it was John. Jim, no, Jim McIntyre. Now, he was a former farmer, but he was also chairman of the health board at one time and as he gave up his position in the health board he came on to our committee so he at that time was an excellent person because he had the contacts down there and I, I think Jim did an awful lot of good work for us in that department with the medical people you know he, he got things done <laughs> because he'd, he'd been in that position so the, he was there uh, there was an ex-director of the education, um, Mr. Gunn. He was there and he had been on that committee, I think maybe from the beginning. I'm not sure, but he was another character uh, there. Uh, Jan Holak, I've mentioned, she was the artist. Uh, uh, I've already mentioned Kenny. Um, there was an, we had an architect too. Uh, he was he was excellent in the building construction and how how it should be done initially. He he was excellent, and that fellow unfortunately retired and he went up the north, I think. Aha, uh -huh. he lived in Westwood Avenue, and he. he brought a lot of expertise on the building side of it, you know, what, what shouldn't, shouldn't be done. Um, what was his name now? Oh, I'm beginning to forget names now. Um, Jean, Jean was his wife, Jean. No, I can't get it, sorry. 
and this, but he he was good too. So we had professional people with us, you know, all the way. And then Pat and I used to go to quarterly, a uh, conventional kind of. That wasn't the name they gave them, but it was committee meetings of the all areas. I think they, but well, maybe every three months or so we went. I think, or maybe quite. I think it was every three months, or maybe it was every four months, three or four times a year. And we had to report on what we were doing, you know, and how the finances were and all that. And that these were great meetings, these these were really good. And that's how we got to know so many of, of the St John people, you know. But I don't know any of them now, because they've all come off. See, we all get older <laughs> and we're useless. <laughs> You say you found these meetings useful yes. in meeting the other areas. Yes. Um, what did you learn from them? Well, we learned things from them, like uh, what they were doing. But we, at that time, were <laughs> on on the, the cusp, as it were. Uh, and they said, oh, yes, you know, a small area like that, and you're doing this, you see. That was that was good. We, we, we were... We were uh, I think that's where our ideas kind of sprang and we've got palliative care units in one or two places and the transport too has, is, has swelled and of course St John but then I, this is really from Edinburgh St John itself you know has given mountain a rescues a, a, a vehicles you know and, and really good and they cost a bomb and also they have built a new a premises for for, for the the, the rest, a mountain rescue. We've done a lot of work there, and now, of course, they're hoping to give defibrillators to all the villages in Scotland that don't have them. You know, so that's a great thing too. And Rotary are into that too because they they Rotary have, have provided one for Stranraer. I think it's at the castle there. So you know, there's a lot of things going on, and they're they're a uh, first. What is it called? First, first responders. First responders. That's a big thing with St John. We don't have that down here at the moment. Whether whether that's in the pipeline, I don't know. Can you tell me what are your favourite memories of working with St John Scotland? Well, the working through the palliative care, that was just terrific. And I never had a refusal for, from anyone. And of course, backed up by Pat and John. They, they were always with me around, you know. It, it, was, oh, it, was, it was great, it really was. What do you see as the challenges for St John Scotland in this area now? Well, they're, they're into this res first responder now. Uh, I haven't been in touch personally with any of them, you know, from headquarters. Um, but they, they've got good ideas, there's no doubt about it. And of course, there's been a lot of change, you know. I think it's Eleanor, Duchess of, of Argyle, has taken over a young woman, and she's the first woman prior. So that's an interesting development. I think that's going to be a very interesting development what she brings to it, because she's younger, she'll have new ideas, and which is, is good. That's what we need. Most of the other areas that I've been working with say that um, getting new volunteers on Oh, board. yes. That, that's going to be an upward job. That is going to be an upward job, because look at your volunteer organisations now. Boys Brigade, Scouts, Guides, Rosebuds, whatever else, Cubs, well they're not called Cubs now. Uh, all, uh, all these organisations have no affiliation to churches. So kids don't come to church. So they're growing up in a different social uh, type of society. This is what it is. And sometimes you begin to wonder what kind of society they are because some of them have no conception of what it's like 
to help others and they're not interested you know so I, I think it's going to that's going to be an uphill uh, thing although in some areas are better than others you know but it, it is difficult getting voluntary volunteers now on committees because there's so many things on on Sundays for example who would, who would want to go to a church now? A youngster. When there's football, swimming, judo, you know, etc, etc. <laughs> Do you think for um, future fundraising activities would be a, more difficult to organise than before? It might be. Might be, but on the other hand, People are quite gently and generous, really. If it's a, if they if they see it as as a cause, I mean that palliative care. People saw that as a big cause. It was a necessary thing, and it was a big development here. You know. And cancer is well one of the number one causes of, of death, even yet. Although I think the heart, people are very much up, up, up at, at that level too. But uh, there will always be a need for, that, for this kind of thing, I think. Some people have remarked that St John Scotland doesn't promote itself Correct, as much. I would agree on that. Uh -huh. Could you they, kind of they, they, they put out a paper some time ago about that to all the members asking for their their comments and I did write in and say that I thought their uh, advert uh, you know they weren't advertising themselves nearly enough and that has improved I think I think but again COVID has kind of curtailed that completely at the moment so it's it's been in cotton wool I think it's wrapped in cotton wool at the moment but yes uh, no I think I think I agree now we have uh, uh, a lady, I won't mention her name, uh, I don't think that would be right, uh, on the committee who is the, um, well, advertising agent. Uh, she came on for that reason. I've never seen a thing in the paper by her for a long time. But then COVID's maybe got something to do with that. You see, they're not meeting, they weren't allowed to meet and they would only meet uh, in this virtual system, which isn't the same. You can't get things done now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. I don't know. In fact, I know I am. <laughs> what are your hopes for the future of St John Scotland? Well, I, ho I hope it may... Well, of course, it does a lot of good work in a... Uh, Jerusalem in the hospital and that I mean must continue of course it's an international thing and there's a, a lot of the the colonial uh, folk people have their own sections throughout the world there was one in Hong Kong and when I was in Hong Kong I of course I knew there was such a thing as St John and I used to examine the, the youngsters with their marching and, and all their, their, their thing, and they were beautifully turned out. Uh, I would take off on a Sunday, and there were maybe a thousand of them there. I never realised, you know, it was the same affiliation. I didn't at that time, you know, I didn't myself, because I wasn't in, in, involved with it at that time. But uh, no, it's an international thing, so that's an important thing to to continue with definitely but I think we want to spread our our uh, a word round much better than we have done we, we, we've, we've kind of uh, held, held, held our, our uh, reputation of it uh, I think we've, uh, to, to our detriment I would agree and then we have the annual festival of course uh, I hope that continues but again, it's not the same. When I first began, oh gosh, it was awe-inspiring. You had all the, the military people 
connected with St John, you know, in the regalia. Men who had been in the war and all that kind of thing. Well, of course, that's more or less all gone, except the Queen's representatives now. You know, they, 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 they always, they're always there. But, uh, no, I think they, they could do a lot with their advertising. What do you think about the hierarchy of the Order of St John? Well, it has changed a lot. It has really changed. It is a hierarchical institute, that's right. And, of course, uh, it was Queen Victoria uh, who gave them the, the charitable thing, you know, a, an order, an order of chivalry. How would you say it's changed over the years? In recent years it's changed a lot. Um, well, it's it's now more an international, you know, thing. The prior used to be in England, you know, and everything else was subsidiary. Now, the uh, area, you know, well, countries, I think, have their own prior and then you've got the Grand Prior, who is still the Duke of um, Gloucester. You're right. That's right. You're quite right. Gloucester. And he, he's a nice soul. He's a nice, but again, he's elderly. So somebody, some of, of the other members of the royal family will take that over. Of course, the Queen is the number one. And long may she reign, <laughs> really. You know. What about the gender um, situation? Um, do you think that there are now more or fewer women than there used to be? Oh, I think there's more. I think there would. I think you could say this. Yes, I would think so. That, that I never felt any difference. You know, certainly maybe in our. No, I don't even need to think in our committee. I'm trying to think of what all the men, the men were on one side and the women more than the other usually. Ah, uh -huh, that's right, it's just about equal. Ah, uh -huh. no, I never found that a, a, a difficulty at all, no. Sounds like a high school ball. Ah, uh -huh. uh, just about it, uh, just about it. Uh -huh. we, had, we had good fun too. It was hard, hard work, mind you. I know that the committee were dead in the street at the end of it. Oh, they, they were. And that's why we kind of drew back for a year or two, you know. But still the money came in. Again, the palliative care unit was bringing in money, you know. And we, well, we still carried on, you know. But not to the same extent with, you know, it, it was almost every, every committee meeting there was something else on the go that, that meant work. You know, that kind of thing. But everybody pulled their weight. It was amazing. It was a lovely, a lovely committee to be on. Mm -hmm. I think that's all of my questions. Oh, is it? <laughs> is there anything that you would like to add? No, not really. As I say, the person who should have been here today was Pat. I hope I've done her justice. <laughs> oh, you have. You have. And more. Thank you very much, Anne. You're very welcome. It's been much appreciated.